I recently found this nice article in the College Math Journal that allows us to write the second derivative of a function in terms of the area of a triangle. Well, it's not exactly the area of a triangle, it's the limit of the signed area of a triangle. So I think this is a really nice result, so I thought I'd make a video about it. So let's maybe see the setup here, but before we do that, let's recall the limit definition of the derivative. So the derivative of a function f at a is defined to be the limit as x goes to a of f of x minus f of a over x minus a. Of course, there's another you know, equivalent definition that looks like f of a plus h minus f of a over h, the so-called difference quotient, but I think we're gonna use this one today. Okay, so let's now look at the picture of our setup. So here we've got the graph of a function f in yellow, and then I've put two points on this graph. So one, which I'll call capital A, so it has x coordinate of a and y coordinate, well, clearly of f of a because it's on the graph. And then we have another point, capital B, and it has x coordinate b, y coordinate f of b. And then what we'll do is we'll draw tangent lines to the graph y equals f of x at a and b. And then we'll look for their intersection, and their intersection we'll call a point P. Okay, so that's our setup. And then the result is as follows. So the second derivative of f at the point a, so that's this point over here, is eight times the limit as b goes to a of the signed area of that triangle a, b, p over b minus a cubed. So notice I've got this limit as b goes to a, but what that's doing is that's pushing capital B to capital A. So it's pushing those two points together. So if you recall, the second derivative measures the curvature or maybe the concavity of a function. So I think maybe we can see that this area is somehow like giving us information to the average concavity when these points are far apart, but then the instantaneous concavity, whatever that is, when the points limit towards each other. Okay, so now that we've got this set up, let's get started. And we're gonna start with a simplification. And that simplification will be to assume that our point capital A is in fact just the origin. And this may seem like a bit of a cop out, but we could do this by redefining our function, like instead of having f of x, we could replace that with f of x plus a minus f of a. So that simply has the effect of shifting this entire graph without changing the shape to put this point capital A at the origin. But this just simplifies a lot of our calculation. Okay, so now that we've got that, what I'd like to do next is to find our point P. So that means I need the tangent line at the origin and then the tangent line at B. So let's see, the tangent line at the origin, which recall that the origin is A at this point because of our shifting, has equation Y equals F prime of zero times X. So clearly the slope will be F prime of zero. That's what the derivative does. And then well, that tangent line is also going to go through the origin. That's why we have a y-intercept of zero. And then the tangent line of B via first semester calculus could be written as y equals f prime of B, and then x minus the x part of the point, which is B, plus the y part of the point, which is f of B. Okay, so there's the tangent to A and the tangent to B. Now we need to look for their intersection. So we'll look for their intersection simply by setting these two equal to each other. So that gives us the equation f prime of zero times x equals 
f prime of b times x minus b times f prime of b plus f of b. After I've moved some things around, but now let's observe here that I can move this f prime of x over to the other side of the equation. So I'll just change this equals to a minus and then I'll put an equals here. Okay, great. And then from there we can factor some stuff out of this left hand side. Notice that we could factor out an f prime of zero and then minus an f prime of b that's multiplied by x. And then let's change the order here to have f of b minus b times f prime of b, just so that we don't like have that hanging minus sign. But now let's observe that we get an x value of f of b minus b times f prime of b all over f prime of uh, zero minus f prime of b. Okay, so that's where we are at the moment. And then let's see, if that's our x coordinate, then our y coordinate will simply be f prime of zero multiplied into this x coordinate. Okay, so maybe we'll call this p little p and then the y coordinate will be little q. And what that'll do is give us just some notation here. So we've got A is the origin, B is equal to the point B, F of B, and then P is equal to the point P, and then F prime of zero times P, where P is this object right here. So let's fit that in. So P is equal to F of B, minus b times f prime of b over f prime of zero minus f prime of b. Okay, great. So that's where we are, and now we're ready to move on. Okay, so now we're ready to calculate the signed area. That'll be the next step, and then we'll take the limit of that signed area over our b minus a cubed. But notice if we're assuming that little a is equal to zero, we can actually simplify this quite a bit. So I'm just gonna replace all of these little a's with the number zero because recall that we've done that shift. So we're looking for f double prime of zero, which means we need the limit as b goes to zero. And here we'll have simply a b cubed in the denominator. Okay, now let's look at this signed area, which I'll call s area, like I said. So the signed area of triangle ABP can be calculated as one half times the determinant of a certain three by three matrix. So it's one half because what, what's really happening is we are calculating the parallelogram that's defined by maybe like the vector from B to P and the vector from A to P. So you could complete that into a parallelogram. And then, well, the area of that parallelogram is related to the cross product of those two vectors, but then the cross product of those two vectors can be written as the determinant of a matrix. But then after that, you can do some row operations and get it down to the following matrix. So we have the determinant of one zero f of zero. So that's like our coordinates of our point A, which like we fixed to the origin with the one at the top. And then here we'll have one P and then F prime of zero times P. So that's like the coordinate P. Uh, and by that, I mean this point here. And then next we'll have one B F of B. That's like our point B. So now we can calculate this very easily with cofactor expansion. And that's based off the fact that f of zero is equal to zero. So we simply have to cofactor expand down this first column, which means all we really need is to take the determinant of this resulting two by two matrix and then multiply it nominally by the number one. So that's gonna give us one half times P 
And then we'll have f of b minus b times f prime of zero. Notice that I factored a p out and then I'm just using the definition for the determinant. But observe that we can maybe put this value of p in and then we've got something that we can work with. So we'll have f of b minus b times f prime of b, and then that's multiplied into f of b minus b times f prime of zero. I think it's uh, interesting how similar those two things in the numerator are. And then this is gonna be all over two times f prime of zero minus f prime of b. Okay, so there we are at the moment. Now we'll multiply this by eight, divide it by b cubed, and then calculate the limit. Okay, so let's get to that. Okay, so I just put everything together that we've done so far. And now we're gonna use something called Taylor's theorem to do a simplification here. Because notice at this moment we've got an indeterminate form and we need to do quite a bit of simplification. I think you could maybe do L'Hopital's rule here, but I think it would take several steps and it would be pretty gnarly. Okay, so Taylor's theorem says that f evaluated at b, notice that b is like kind of a variable here with respect to the limit. So f of b is equal to f of zero plus uh, b times f prime of zero plus uh, b squared over two times f double prime of some number c. So you might say, well, wouldn't it be uh, some number, well, wouldn't that number be zero? Well, that would be the number if we were talking about a Taylor polynomial, in which case this would be an approximation. But Taylor's theorem gives us something exactly here, where all we know about this c value is that it's somewhere between uh, zero and b. So this comes from the remainder part of Taylor's theorem. But let's recall that f of zero is zero by our shifting assumption. So we simply have here this equation. I'll just bring the f of b down is equal to b times f prime of zero plus b squared over two times f double prime of c, where, like I said before, this c is between zero and b. So I'm gonna box that in magenta because that's what we will use. So now what I'll do is take all of the instances where I see f of b and replace them with what we have right here. Okay, great. So let's maybe bring this down. So we have four and then the limit as b approaches zero and then observe that my denominator is not changing. So I'm simply gonna copy that down. So f prime of zero minus f prime of b and that's all multiplied by b cubed. Okay, now for the first instance, I have b f prime of zero minus or plus this b squared over two f double prime of c. So put into here, nothing really simplifies. So I simply have to write all of that out. So let's see. Here we'll have, like I said before, b f prime of zero and then minus b times f prime of b and then plus b squared over two times f double prime of c. I commuted some things around there mostly because now in the next Step, we can factor a b out of that stuff that I have uh, overlined. And now let's observe what happens in the next portion in this f of b minus b times f prime of zero. We'll observe that that's gonna cancel this first term in our Taylor's theorem object, leaving us simply with b squared over two times f double prime of c. So let's write that down. So we've got b squared divided by two, f double prime of c. And now let's do a bit of simplification. So I can take this two right here and cancel this four down to a two. And then I can take this b squared right here and cancel this b cubed down to a b. And then what I'll do is take these two things that I have overlined and distribute the f double prime of c 
you know, through on them. So let's see, that's gonna leave us with something like this. So I still have this two out front. Now I have this limit as B approaches zero, F double prime of C. And then we're splitting these two things that are blue overlined up with the denominator. I think I said I was gonna distribute the F double prime of C through, but we're actually not gonna do that. Okay, so let's see what happens. So for this first term, the, these b's here and here cancel, and that simply leaves us with f prime of zero minus f prime of b over, oh, that's the same thing. So we have the number one. And then after that, we'll have plus b over two times f double prime of c over f prime of zero minus f prime of b. Okay, so that's where we are. But I'm gonna rewrite this just a little bit. I'm gonna take this b and I'm gonna swap it with the f double prime of c. So f double prime of c here and then a b here. And then, well, let's observe that this object which I'm boxing in purple looks like this limit definition of the derivative, but it's the derivative of the derivative and it's occurring at the point zero. And the limit of this will be minus one over f double prime of zero. So we've got that reciprocal because notice it's, it's the reciprocal of the limit that we have over here and we've got a minus sign because the difference is happening in the opposite order. Okay, so now let's bring all of this down. So we've got a two on the outside. We still have our limit as B goes to zero. We have F double prime of C times the quantity, one minus a one half times F double prime of C over F double prime of zero. Okay, nice. But now let's look at the final step. Notice as B approaches zero, that's gonna sandwich C so that it also has to approach zero, which means this F double prime of C will approach F double prime of zero. It'll approach F double prime of zero there and it'll approach F double prime of zero here. But that gives us an F double prime of zero over an F double prime of zero, which cancels this out just simply to a one half. But now observe that we've got two f double prime of zero times one minus one half, but one minus one half is a half. So that cancels everything down to simply give us f double prime of zero, which is where we wanted to end up. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button. Subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, Subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.